Good morning. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate the 21st Sunday in Ordinary Time. We would like to invite you to please join us today after Mass for the parish picnic from noon to three. There will be activities for all ages, good company, and good food. We hope to see you there. Our readings today and the propers for our Mass may be found in the St. Isaac Missal, beginning on page 601. Now please stand as we begin our Sunday Eucharist.
what you command and to desire what you promise, that amid the uncertainties of this world, our hearts may be fixed on that place where true gladness is found. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Joshua. Joshua gathered together all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, summoning their elders, their leaders, their judges, and their officers. When they stood in ranks before God, Joshua addressed all the people. If it does not please you to serve the Lord, decide today whom you will serve. The gods your fathers served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose country you are now dwelling. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord for the service of other gods. For it was the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt, out of a state of slavery. He performed those great miracles before our very eyes and protected us along our entire journey and among the peoples through whom we passed. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. The word of the Lord. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands, as to the Lord. 
For the husband is the head of his wife, just as Christ is head of the church. He himself the savior of the body. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church, and handed himself over for her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So also, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one hates his own flesh, but rather nourishes and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and the church. The word of the Lord. Recognizing that, that I have to make this radical risk 
and say that I can't do it by myself. And so I'm willing to trust. I'm willing to remain with Jesus because I'm convinced, I come to believe that He is God among us. But I also know that I can make this fundamental, I can make this profound, and I can make this radical sort of trust that if I cast in my lot with Him, it'll all be okay. And it can be hard to do. It can be difficult. And it can be challenging. Right, ladies? Married ladies? Because you've got to be submissive to your husbands. You've got to be subordinate to them. And you do want flesh. Now, rather than talking more and more this morning about John's gospel, because we've heard it now for a number of weeks, I'm drawn to that second reading that speaks to us about the Christian vocation of marriage. And I want to speak about that instead today. I want to do sort of cheating, if you'll let me cheat. Can I cheat? Sure. Good. And adopt what I normally preach when I do a wedding. Because this reading, that second reading, that speaks to us about this, this mystery and teaching of what Christian marriage is all about, well, I think we can also oftentimes need a refresher. Because I'm going to imagine that most of us in here of a certain age are either married, have been married, or are thinking about being married at some point. And am I right? You want to get married? <laughs> and I would too if a woman would have me, but I'm just kidding. Well, let me tell you then what I tell you. What I tell the bride and what I tell the groom. The first thing that I tell them. And the first aspect of Christian marriage that I think this, God, this second reading challenges us, Paul's teaching challenges us to remember, is what love actually is. Because our society, our larger culture, tells us something very different than what it is for a Christian. In our larger society and culture, it's an emotion that one falls into, or more often than not falls out of. It's amazing when a young couple comes to me in my office, for the marriage preparation, one of the first questions that I always ask, I say, do you love him? I say, oh yes, Father, I do. I say, how do you know it? Oh, and, and inevitably, especially if they're younger, I get, well, I just get butterflies. It's an emotion. I don't know what happened, I just love him. It's an emotion. Well, let me tell you something. When you got married, whether it was only a few years ago or perhaps a few more. I'm sure you looked at your husband and you thought, geez, he looks good. He lost all sorts of weight. He went to the gym. He got ready to fit into the smallest tux he could get into. But I'm sure that at some point, there came a day <laughs> yeah, daddy. <laughs> when you looked at him, you said, my gosh, he looks like his dad. <laughs> well, here's the thing. If your love has simply been a question of an emotional response you've made, what happens on that day when that emotion isn't there? What happens on that day when well, the butterflies just aren't quite the same? What happens on that day if you've only just been sort of led blindly because love is blind? That's what culture says, right? What happens on that day when all of a sudden you start to see? We've got a problem. But you see, it's at exactly at this point, it's exactly in this moment that our Christian tradition, that the gospel teaches, the church teaches, you see, Love isn't an emotion. It isn't an act of what we call in theology the passions. It's an act of the intel, excuse me, it's an act of the will. In other words, love isn't something you fall into. Love is something you choose. You choose to love the other person. And that's a choice that you make in a, in a radical and profound and public way in the moment you exchange your vows, but also has to be sort of remade each day. You choose to love the other person. It's an abiding kind of friendship. It's not sort of a perduring 
you know, not a, it's sort of like a contract. You choose to love. And so when sort of the butterflies aren't quite the same, and when sort of, you know, let's just say the pecs move to the glutes, <laughs> what hasn't changed? What hasn't sort of moved off the mark? is the decision and the choice to love the other person. The second thing I always like to remind them, and probably most of you now who have been married for some time know it, is that your spouse is the mechanism, is the vehicle, is the instrument through which God has chosen those called the married life to become holy. Did you hear what I said? In the working in the mystery of divine providence, your spouse is the unique instrument that God has chosen for your sanctification and for your holiness. Now maybe that's no more than teaching you how to be a saint of patience. But how often do we look at our spouse? Do we look at him or do we see her and think, this is the one God has chosen to make me a saint, to make me holy. And that is the result, do we value and cherish the other because of who they are and who they have been called to be in my life. And by the same token, if I've been called for, to, to be for her the means of her holiness and sanctification, the means in which she is drawn closer to God, how do I live into that role? How do I live into that aspect of my vocation and my calling? to be a Christian husband, or to be a Christian wife. That's the second point I think we need to think about. And the third one, and I love doing this to the brides, especially in light of that, wives be submissive to your husbands, and you'll, you'll never want me to marry any of your children by the time I'm done with this piece. Because I usually always say to the bride, I say, Sally, all your friends and your family is here, all the people that you know that are most important that you cherish, it, that everyone's together with you. And here now, publicly in front of all of them and in front of God Himself, I ask you to make me a promise. I ask you to promise that you will always make yourself subordinate to Him. You'll always make yourself number two. You'll always, you know, move and work to put His desires and His wants, His needs and His wishes ahead of yours. Will you promise? publicly now, to be number two to him in your marriage. Now I can tell you, the first time I did this, the bride was from Wellesley. There were audible groans in the congregation. <laughs> but she managed to choke out a yes. And then I looked at her husband and I said, Bob, you owe me. Now let's go on with the right of marriage. I did say that. That he's here looking at me like I did. Instead of, oh, you know what I did? I looked at him and I said, Bob, you just heard the promise that she made. Will you make the same one? Will you strive to make her number one in the marriage? Will you strive and will you promise to make her desires and her needs, her wants and her wishes number one? Will you strive to be number two in this relationship? Now, usually by that time, he says yes. And then I make the point. Only when you strive constantly to outdo each other in being number two in the relationship can the marriage be number one. But the moment, it seems to be, the moment that one spouse says, oh no, this is, I gotta be number one, you gotta be number two, and you gotta make this work for me, that's the moment we have a real problem. And that's the moment of crisis. The vocation of Christian marriage is one of the sort of mutual subordination. It's called out in a unique way in this text from St. Paul. But what I think ultimately is going around here in this text is this idea that if we not each support them to the other in various ways, if we, we don't put the marriage first, we don't put the bond first, we don't make the relationship primary. And that's what we have to do. So on this warm summer day, we're called to a radical trust in Jesus Christ. We're called to sort of throw our lot in with him 
And that means we have to sort of stand at, at, at various moments and at various times, sort of in opposition to, a, to the larger values and presuppositions and orientations of the world. And one of the unique ways where that plays out in our contemporary society is with regard to marriage. And so for those of you who are married, or for those of you about to be married, for those of you contemplating marriage, or for those of you who hope one day you will be married, remember always what it means to love as a Christian. It's a choice, not a passion. Remember that your spouse is the unique person through which God has called you into a deeper relationship with him and as a means to your own holiness, and you are for her, and you are for him as well. Don't lose sight of your vocation. And constantly, constantly resolve and strive to make the other the first in the marriage, so that the marriage itself can always be number one. That's the challenge. That's the teaching of the church. That's what we're called to do if we remain in Christ and we trust and believe in him. Amen. And God bless you. Having heard the word of God, let us now, with one voice, profess our common faith. I believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. And I believe in the one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, God from not made, substantial with the Father.
sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands. We praise and glory of His name for our good and the glory of His holy church. O God, who gained for yourself a people by adoption, through the one sacrifice offered once for all, bestow on us the gifts of unity and peace in your church, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit, through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share of the Paschal mystery. And so with all the angels we praise you, as in joyful celebration we acclaim. <laughs> Savior's command, informed by the divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, 
deliver us, Lord, from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
complete within us, Lord, the healing work of your mercy, and per graciously perfect and sustain us, so that in all things we may please you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth. The Mass is ended. Thank Thanks be to God. God. Our recessional hymn is number 689, your St. Michael's hymn.